Good morning, church. How's everyone doing today? So good to see so many here. It is such a blessing to be with you guys. Will you stand with me? I'm gonna read from Ephesians 3, verse 12, and it says, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I will ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of the sufferings, which are your glory. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we come to you with freedom and confidence. How good it is to say that, Lord. We worship you because you are the only one who is worthy. And so let our hearts be focused on you. May our direction be only looking at you, Jesus. We pray this in your holy name. In the name of Jesus, amen. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My
Sometimes I find there's a fall in the road Should I stay, should I try to climb higher To do what I'm made for And know oh, the good shepherd To breathe in the air of the mountain Fill my lungs with the air of the mountain And you are my holy God My vision in the heights Miles and miles high I don't see you getting tired And oh, good shepherd I'll follow
Jesus. We thank you this morning, Jesus. We thank you this morning, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, and we thank you. Lord, even this morning, I wasn't even expecting that song, Lord, how it reminds me, it reminds us, God, you are the shepherd. (laughs) You are the shepherd, Lord. And you have the lead. And God, sometimes we, we forget about that with the circumstances, the things that are around us. We get confused. And but God, you are the shepherd. And God, you're leading us. You're leading us, God, and I thank you for that this morning. God, and you are faithful, as the song says, you are faithful. God, you are faithful this morning, and I thank you for that. God, you are an awesome God. Lord, I declare it this morning. You're an awesome God, Lord, and you are, you are, you are doing great things. God, this morning, I just thank you, Lord. Jesus. Jesus, that even though sometimes we find ourselves maybe in some Some areas that we don't understand, Lord, you are the shepherd and you are leading us, God, and you are in control. God, may we not forget that, Lord, and I thank you this morning for that, Jesus. Because even though I might get a little confused, Lord, you're never confused. God, you have a plan and a purpose, Lord, and I thank you for that this morning. You are so faithful. Lord, I can go on this morning praising you because you are so faithful and you deserve praise this morning. God, we came into this house, Lord, expecting great things from you and to worship you, Lord, this morning. And that's what we're doing, God. And that's what we'll continue to do because you deserve it. God, you deserve it this morning, Jesus. And Lord, it's real hard for me not to get excited. Because God, I know how great you are. Lord, I know that you have a plan and a purpose for our lives. And God, I know that you are faithful this morning. And God, may we continue to worship you and put you first in our lives this morning, Lord. I just pray, Lord, this morning, Lord, that God, in our church this morning, there are needs. God, there are many needs, Lord, whether they're here or whether they're not here this morning in this building, God, there are needs. And God, I believe this morning that you, for every need, you have an answer. God, I believe this morning, Lord, that you have an answer, Lord, no matter where we find ourselves this morning. God, we have, you have an answer, Lord, this morning. So, Lord, I just remember a couple of those needs here this morning, Lord. I pray, Lord, for Frank, Lord. Frank Kessler, Lord, he needs a touch from you, Lord. You see him where he's at, Lord. And I pray, God, that you will continue to pour into him, oh, God, I pray. Lord, we continue to pray for uh, Miss Betty, Lord, who, Lord, needs a touch from you, Lord. God, you see her where she's at this morning or in Alpha, Lord. I pray for them this morning. God, I pray for them where they're at this morning, Jesus, that they would sense and feel the power of your Holy Spirit on their lives, even this morning, Lord. I pray for Fred and Margaret today. God, I pray for them today, Lord. God, that you would touch him, Lord, this morning. And God, this morning, I can't but pray for Hank and Carol this morning. And I pray for them today as they're at home, Lord, this morning. And I hope they can hear me this morning because, God, I pray for them right now. Jesus, I believe, Lord, 
God, you've been with them through the years, Lord, and you will continue to be with them, Lord. I pray for them that you will touch them, Lord, this morning. Uh, for, for Trudy, Lord, Lord, needs a touch from you, Lord. We remember her, oh God. And Lord, this morning, God, this morning, I believe that there are lots of requests in this room. God, there are lots of requests in this room this morning. And God, I believe this morning, as I said already, that every need, you have an answer. And God, this morning, you see the folks that are in this room where they can hear me online. And Lord, this is not just words, because I ask you this morning uh, that God, that you would put in my heart, oh God, your words. And Lord, your vision in me, oh God. Lord, that it's your will and not mine. God, I pray this morning for the needs that are in this church, Lord, or in, it can hear my voice this morning. God, you know them this morning. You know where they're at here this morning. And as they worship you, Lord, and lift up hands to you, I pray this morning that, God, that your spirit would rest on them even now, Lord, that you would touch them where they're at. God, where they're at this morning, God, may they leave your chains this morning wherever they are. God, you see the needs. And some of them are great, Lord, this morning. And Lord, I pray, God, this morning, Lord, I pray especially before I conclude, God, I have to. Lord, I pray for Pastor Natalie that sits here at the front this morning, Lord. God, I pray for her, Lord, this morning especially, God. God, I pray for her, oh God, where she's at this morning. Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you have been her direction. Lord, you have been her shepherd. Lord, you have been the one in whom she trusts through the years, oh God. And I pray for her this morning. That God, that you would pour into her, oh God. Amidst it all, Lord, this morning, you would pour into her, oh God. Jesus, we all do. She especially does, Lord, need a fresh touch from you, Lord, this morning. Not just a fresh touch, but God. Lord, you're the God, you're the same God yesterday, today. And forever you don't change. And God, I pray this morning, Lord, that you would, Lord, just rest on her, rest on us as a church this morning. That God, that we would see, I believe, Lord, today that there's, there's a revival that's coming. Your spirit is going to be poured out. And God, I want to be found in the center of that this morning. Lord, I ask this in your name. Lord, I pray for Joel this morning as he brings your word. God, I pray for him. I thank you for his service, Lord. But God, I, Lord, I pray for him this morning. You bring the word that quickens our heart. God, may we leave here, Lord. May we leave here changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray. And I ask this in your holy name. Lord, in your holy name. And we all said amen, amen. and amen. God bless you, everyone. Can we just sing that one more time? Just faithful you are, John Luke, if you could. As you lead us. Faithful you are, faithful you'll be. We pour out our praise for the way you lead. Faithful you are, faithful you'll be forever. Catch that church before, today, and forever. Faithful you are. Sing it. Faithful you'll be. Pour out, Pour out your praise. praise the way you lead. Faithful you are, faithful you'll be forever, forever. John 10.10, 10, book of John, says, A thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come so that you may have life and life in abundance. And then we continue. I am the good shepherd. Hmm. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you for being our Savior. Welcome to church this morning. How are we this morning? Good, good. Can we thank our music team, please? Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Christina. <laughs> I, uh, you guys can have a seat for a second. We have a couple of announcements to get through even this morning. I did want to welcome you here and also welcome uh, those in our online congregation this morning who are joining us uh, either via YouTube 
or via Facebook as well this morning on our live stream. Thank you for joining us. I want to just reiterate that you're not observing, but you are actually part of this service with us wherever you are. And we thank the Lord for uh, the ability to stream these services to uh, every country that there's internet in. So we thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I wanted to make you aware of a couple of things, as I mentioned. Uh, Last Sunday, Pastor Tom mentioned that we are going to be having a 24-hour day of prayer. And that is coming up, and I actually, before I continue, I wanted to show you and uh, put our attention to the screens because we have a little tutorial on how we're going to be able to sign up for that day. Go ahead, guys. All right, so if we didn't catch that, can we thank Erica Kessler for for, uh, putting that video together for us? Thank you, Erica. Um, If you didn't catch all of that, uh, I will just highlight a couple of things. Um, There is a Church Center app. uh, If you have uh, an Apple device that you can go ahead uh, and download that app, and then you can simply just search up. uh, If you haven't before, you can register and search up New Life Church Uh, here in Milton, obviously, and uh, you can select that, and there's a couple of different registration links. You're going to want to hit 24-hour day of prayer coming up on April 24th, Um, and then we can select uh, one of the half-hour time slots. We do have a maximum of uh, two spots available per half hour, uh, so we do encourage you to uh, go ahead and, and head on that app and select a half hour that works for you. Um, now, I do know, I do know that there may be some individuals that, um, let's say they're undeviced people. Technology might not be their best friend. Um, So if you do need some either help getting on that or if you want to just kind of let us know and maybe fill out a paper copy or have us actually input you and select the half hour time slot for you, uh, you can either email with any questions you have at office.administration at newlifemilton.com or you can go and see Erica Kessler or Rebecca Scott at our welcome desk uh, after service. And if you have any questions, and if I missed anything, they'll be sure to let you know what I missed. Amen? It's going to be a great day, April 24th. Next up, we have a church softball team. And uh, this is going to be a softball team that is ages 15 and up. So youth team, I am looking at you because we need to, uh, we need to win some games this year. So I just wanted to let you know about that. Uh, this uh, softball team, the season starts in the month of May. Uh, it plays uh, their games at Brian Best Field, which if you're familiar with Milton at all, is right beside Milton District High School. Uh, and again... If you're wanting to know more about that or if you're wanting to sign up to be on that team, I know Faith and I want to see you this season, um, but if you are wanting to be on that team, you can get in contact with either Phil Mula or Amanda Powell, and I believe their emails will be on the screen or they will be soon. Next, I wanted to let you know as well 
that next Sunday is going to be our next Finger Foods Sunday. Um, So please make sure whatever you are bringing, uh, it is pre-sliced, pre-made, pre-packaged, pre-whatever it needs to be uh, for next Sunday. And we do encourage you uh, to share together, knowing how generous of a church family and a congregation we are. Uh, Let's all pitch in, bring something, and uh, we'll have a good time of fellowship together next Sunday. This is also our kids' time dismissal. Uh, So parents of our little ones, all three classes are open this morning. So that'll be ages three to five, grades one to three, and grades four to six. And you can just slip out and make your way uh, to the Black Box Theater at this point. Uh, And as they're doing that, why don't we all stand again? We've had a little time to sit, but why don't we stand, have a time to greet each other, say hello, maybe meet somebody you've never met before, uh, and shake three or four hands. seated again. And online, if you guys want to take an opportunity at this point in the comment section, just let us know where you're joining us from. We'd love to know and love to connect with you as well. Uh, At this point, I'd like to invite our ushers uh, to join me at the front. We're going to take a time to um, take up an offering of our tithes and offerings to the Lord. So guys, we can make our way to the front, please. And as they're doing so, why don't I just take an opportunity to pray over this just quickly. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for another opportunity to gather. We thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to live in a country where we can do this freely. God, what a privilege. Let that never be lost on us. So, God, I ask in this time where we do give you your tithes and our offerings, Lord, I just ask you to bless it, to multiply it, and uh, to help us put it to good use for the furthering of your gospel and the ministry of New Life Church in Milton. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And as we go, I would just like to let you know that I have the honor of introducing Pastor Joel Spiridigliazzi today, this morning. How did I do, Pastor Joel, with that? Pastor Joel Spiridigliazzi. Thank you very much. He is the regional director for the Greater Toronto Area of the Western Ontario District of the PEOC Fellowship. So can we give him a good God bless you as he comes? Thanks, Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good to be with you, and uh, as you worship the Lord and your giving, uh, it is a joy to be with you and uh, worship together. Uh, Our God is alive as we were uh, worshiping. I just felt, you know, the Lord uh, comes to you with the key of David, and uh, because he has the key of David, what the Lord opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. And so that's not uh, just for you as a church, but it's also for you as individuals. You have a God who is for you. And if he is for you, who can be against you, right? And so, uh, again, it is um, a pleasure and an honor to share the word of God. Before I do that, uh, just to let you know, I am so thankful for the leadership of this congregation. Your uh, board of deacons have just been a joy to pray with, to uh, talk with, to uh, plan with. And um, in a couple of weeks, you're gonna hear Pastor Tom, which also I am so incredibly grateful for. I think you are as well, would you agree? Pastor Tom has been serving you as your transition pastor, and I'm thankful for the gift uh, that he is to us. And in a couple of weeks, you'll hear Pastor Tom and the, and the board just let you know that we are going to begin the first stage as we think about your future, as we think about who the Lord would have to lead your congregation in the years ahead. And so in the first stage, what we want to do is we want to hear from you. 
Uh, and we're going to send you a survey that will allow us to, because we believe that the church is the people. It is the body of Christ. And so we want to discern the voice of the Lord uh, together as we uh, think about your future, which is very bright. Uh, and so um, we're going to send you a survey in the beginning part of May. We want you to take the time to grab a coffee, a tea, and fill that survey out. Uh, it'll be uh, digitally available and also hard copy available uh, after a Sunday gathering. And that will allow us to assess your strengths, which there are many of because of the great leadership over so many years. And so uh, your strengths and your areas of growth. And so uh, please be aware of that coming up in a couple weeks. And I just want to say the Lord is pleased with this leadership team at New Life. May the Lord continue to strengthen you and grant you wisdom. The Lord is also pleased with uh, my dear sister, Natalie. Uh, I, as we were worshiping, I just felt the divine nod of approval over your life, that the smile of God is over her life today. Uh, he is pleased with her. And, uh, and may the Lord continue to strengthen you, Natalie. May he continue to envelop you with his Holy Spirit. You know, as I was thinking about this morning, the word kept coming to my heart, and the word is resurgence that there would be a resurgence of the Spirit's power in your life and in your church and in our community we call Milton, in our region of Halton, resurgence. When we think about resurgence, there's this aspect of after a season of low activity, God brings everything back into full activity. A resurgence of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit brings life. He brings vigor. He brings revitalization. He brings healing. He brings strength. He brings fresh living water that flows through our lives and through our churches. May there be a resurgence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And in this church we call new life. Now, I, as I thought about that, one of the key ingredients of a resurgence of the spirit, I believe, is humility. I believe that humility and desperation, an understanding of our need for God is paramount if we're ever going to see a resurgence of the Holy Spirit. I wonder if this is precisely why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians these words. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 3 to 5. And he's coming to the people of Corinth, this church that he dearly loves. And it's interesting that this great man of God, this man of faith, the greatest missionary ever, the one who ended up writing more than half of the New Testament, he comes to the church of Corinth. And he says to them these words, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 3 to 5. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and great trembling. Now, I, we got to stop there. That doesn't sound like somebody who's overly confident. <laughs> and yet here's the man of God. And he says, I realize in myself I am nothing. In fact, when I think about my own skill set, as I come to you, I, I, I sense an overwhelming amount of fear and trembling. Maybe there's something there. That if we're going to see a resurgence of the spirit, there's this understanding that without God, we are nothing. That we can't manufacture this. We can't somehow in our own intellect and power kind of bring it to happen. But listen to what he says. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. But rather with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Why is this important? It's important so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but rather on God's power. 
Friends, if we're going to see a resurgence of the Holy Spirit, we must understand that God is the head of the church. That God is the all-powerful one. He is the all-knowing one. He is the all-present one. He is the immutable one. He's the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the one who flung the stars in the galaxy. He's the one who places the planet at just the right distance from the sun. And he allows the moon to pass by the sun in an eclipse. He's in control. And if we're going to see a resurgence, we must understand our posture. Our posture must be one that realizes I am nothing in the presence of the Lord. But in the presence of the Lord, everything changes. Everything changes. My prayer is that your faith, my faith, is not solely resting on great preaching, great intellect, some charismatic personality, but rather may our faith, as Paul writes, rest upon the power and the demonstration. That means when God comes in, things will happen that can only be testified about as the source being God himself. I believe that when there is a resurgence of the Spirit's power, a demonstration of the Spirit's power, three things will happen. And I want to highlight these three things so that we can be aware and look out for them. When there is a resurgence of the Holy Spirit's power in our lives and in our churches, one of the very first things that happens is that there is a resurgence that moves the people of God upward in spiritual maturity. You see, when the Spirit of God comes in, When we understand our posture of humility and dependence and the Holy Spirit is allowed to come in and take control and do what only he can do, what will happen in my life and what will happen in your life will be that we will be moved upward in becoming more like Christ. There will be an aspect of maturity that occurs in our life. It should occur. Because if we're feeling this uh, emotional frenzy, but we don't become more like Jesus and the character of Christ isn't exuding out of our lives, then that's just emotionalism. What we want is that our character and our lives begin to resemble more of the character and actions and reactions of Jesus. That is what resurgence of the Spirit looks like perhaps it's here in Ephesians 4 14 to 15 where we get a hint of this Paul writes he says instead speaking the truth in love we will grow we will grow up we will mature to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is in Christ Friends, before we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, may what comes out of our lives be the fruit of the Spirit, which is evidence that something is going on in here that all of a sudden when I live my life, there is the fruit of the Spirit. There is love that flows out. There is joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things there is is no law notice it says the fruit of the spirit it's singular sometimes we treat the fruit of the spirit like the gifts of the spirit the gifts of the spirit not everybody has all the gifts but every believer has at least one but when it comes to the fruit of the spirit i can't say you know i got love down but joy no i'm as grumpy as you can be it doesn't work that way You either have the fruit or you don't have the fruit. Now, part of the fruit maybe needs a little bit maturing, needs a little bit of growing up. But friends, when the Spirit of God is in our life and there is a resurgence of the Spirit that's flowing in and through our life, there should be a resemblance to the character of Christ. Our actions and our reactions should resemble the Lord's himself. 
Let me illustrate this a little further. Why this is so critical to the heart of God. Mark chapter 11 is this beautiful story and Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. The people are singing and praising. And Jesus comes in, verse 11 of Mark 11. And Jesus enters Jerusalem and he went to the temple courts. The very first place he goes is, I want to go to the house. I want to go to the place of worship. And it says that he looked around at everything. So it's evening and he comes into town and he goes to church. And he walks into the church, into the temple courts, and he looks at everything. You see, God sees everything. Nothing is hidden by the Lord's sight, from the Lord's sight. He walks around and he checks it out. He's noticing, oh, that's interesting. There seems to be some uh, area in the temple courts where there are live sacrifices. And he walks on the other side and he noticed there seems to be a, an exchange booth of some sort of currency exchange. And he looks at everything. Doesn't say anything, but... Since it was already late, Jesus went out to Bethany for the night to rest. Now notice what happens the very next morning. Verse 12. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. (laughs) Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully man. And so, of course, he wakes up and he's hungry for breakfast. And so he's hungry and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, He goes and finds out if it had any fruit. And when he reaches it, he realizes that it had nothing but leaves. Hmm. He's hungry. He's looking to be satisfied. And he sees a fig tree that's full of foliage. Which meant that the chance of that tree having figs in there are pretty high. That tree has the potential to have a lot of figs in it. And so he sees it in the distance, and it's kind of extraordinary because it wasn't really the season for figs yet. But yet this one fig tree is full of leaves. And so he says, assuredly, there are figs there. And so he goes to the fig tree, he, he, he moves all the leaves, and he realizes it's a tree that's nothing but leaves. He says to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard him say it. I want you to tuck that away because we're going to connect what that was all about. Why is he? Maybe he's hangry. (laughs) He finally reaches Jerusalem, even though he couldn't find any figs to eat. And he's upset. He gets into the same temple courts that he explored the night before. And he begins driving out those who were buying and selling there. And he overturns the tables and the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you, you, you have turned it into a den of robbers. We must ask ourselves, what is Jesus so upset about? To the point where he's flipping tables. This is serious. He turns the temple courts into a place of chaos. We've got to ask ourselves, Jesus, why are you so upset? Scholars believe that People would have been coming from a long distance to Jerusalem to the house of God for worship. And so many of them would have been traveling on foot. Only the most affluent would have had some sort of ride to get there. But most would have traveled kilometer after kilometer. Well, of course, when you go to the house of God in Jesus' context, you had to come with an animal sacrifice. And they would sacrifice their animals, their doves, and so on. As a symbol of, of, a, of the remission of sin, they needed to be the forgiveness of sin. And so they would sacrifice an animal. There would be the shedding of blood. And so the, the religious leaders of the day thought to themselves, you know what? We're going to make this really convenient. 
we're actually going to sell the sacrifices on site in the temple courts. And seeing that the people need to buy the sacrifices, we're going to kind of take advantage of them. We're actually going to slap on a surcharge and make money out of this. Now, of course, they then thought, but wait a minute, they're coming from different regions, and so they're going to have different currency to buy the sacrifices. So why don't we make it even more convenient? On the other side of the temple courts, we'll have a money exchange booth. So they're going to come with their foreign currency. We'll be able to exchange it. And guess what? It's another opportunity to slap another surcharge. So they're going to exchange their money, make some money off of them there. They're going to walk across the temple courts, and then they're going to buy their animal animal sacrifice, and then they can worship God. Ah, sounds like a good plan. Not to Jesus. No, 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 not to Jesus. Why not to Jesus is the question. You see, the people reduced faith in God to a commercial transaction, a business deal, rather than a personally transformed life in Christ. Jesus was offended by the idea that a relationship with God was merely an exchange. God, I'll do this, I'll travel, I'll exchange, I'll buy a sacrifice, I'll commit it to you, I'll do all the religious stuff, I'll look the part, but don't ask me to change my life. God is not interested in our business deals. God is not interested in playing church and playing a part. He wants to transform our lives from the inside out. Here's the point to the fig tree. It was a foreshadowing of what was happening in the temple courts. There was a whole lot of activity in the temple courts. There was a whole lot of things going on in the church. The calendar was full. People coming in and out and stuff going on. And... But they didn't have their hearts transformed. They played the part like a fig tree. It looked the part. <laughs> it had all the leaves. It had all the foliage. It had all the potential. But when you get a little closer and you move the leaves, there was no figs. Do you know that every single one of us, including me, are vulnerable to that trap? That we can play a part. We can put our Sunday best and we can come, do our thing, and and leave unchanged. You see, when we talk about the resurgence of the Holy Spirit, God wants to come right into your life and he wants to change you. He wants to transform you. He doesn't want you to be like a fig tree who's just got a whole lot of leaves and playing a part and have the potential to do something great. He wants you to do something great. He wants to do something great in you. He actually wants to break the chains in your life. He actually wants you to change your thinking. He actually wants you to live a life of generosity. He actually wants you to be pure and holy. He actually wants you to be filled with grace and mercy. He actually wants you to forgive those who have offended you. He actually wants to transform us. (laughs) I hope that when he comes under my tree... And he removes all the foliage. That he finds figs there. That he's satisfied because he's hungry. He's hungry for the people of God who are the real deal. He's hungry for a people that actually want to be transformed. He actually wants a relationship. He doesn't just want us to be religious. I wonder... If this passage is a fulfillment to the prophet Micah when he said in Micah 7, 1 and 2, I am like one who gathers summer fruit at the gleaning of the vineyard. There is no cluster of grapes to eat, none of the early figs that I crave. 
The faithful have been swept from the land. Not one upright person remains. My, per- my prayer for us is that our trees would be filled with figs, that there would be fruit that exudes from our life. You see, the religious leaders of Jesus' day struggled with a nothing but leaves kind of faith. Billy Sunday put it this way. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes you a car. My God, my God, may there be such a resurgence of the Spirit where there is a humility in our hearts that say, God, I don't want to be the same anymore. God, I don't just want to play a part. I want to, I want to bear great fruit out of my life for your glory. There's a resurgence of the Spirit in this house and in your life. There will be upward movement to becoming more like Jesus in our actions and in our reactions. Who we are when no one is looking matters. When there's a resurgence of the Spirit, not only will we be moved upward, but we will be moved inward. We will be moved inward to build the church, to build the body of Christ, I believe the resurgence of the Spirit is a movement towards inward building the church with deploying of the gifts of the Spirit. You see, the gifts of the Spirit are given to every believer by God's grace. They are not earned. They are not deserved. They are not developed. They're supernatural, and they're given by God's grace. Every single follower of Jesus has at minimum one spiritual gift. And the reason why God has given you that gift is so that you can deploy it and use it to build and edify the body of Christ. It's not meant to build your own kingdom. It's not given so that you can do your own thing. It's one part of a great body. It's meant to be deployed in community, not in isolation. It's not meant to put on a badge on your shoulder and say, look at me. What I have is the most important. What everybody needs is me. No. (laughs) Because it's been given only by God's grace. And that other brother and sister has been giving another demonstration of God's grace, grace with the gift that they have. You see, the Corinthian church struggled with this. They struggled with two attitudes, mindsets that were not pleasing to the Lord when it came to spiritual gifts. The first one was superiority. You see, some of them in their church thought that my gift is more important than the other gifts. What you really need is more of what I have. We don't need that other stuff. Paul says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. But when we have attitudes of superiority and highlight our gift over other gifts, that's what we're doing. They also struggled with inferiority. There there were some in their church that thought to themselves, my gift isn't important, so I might as well just be a spectator. I can't lead worship, I can't preach, I I don't have those kind of, you know, public gifts, so I might as well just sit in the corner and just sit quiet and just spectate. Paul says to you today, now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. Did you hear that? So Paul is saying, when you allow inferiority to control your life and mindset, and you think, I'm just going to hang tight, I'm just going to, I don't really have a part to play, only because you've made that choice doesn't mean you're not part of the body. What's happening is that that part of the body isn't functioning because you've chosen not to function, which has limited the health and the productivity and the effectiveness of the body of Christ. Friends, we need all hands on deck. If you haven't noticed, our nation needs Jesus like never before. And he needs you to get in the game. He needs you, 
Although you might feel inadequate sometimes and you might feel like you don't have a part to play, you need to overcome that because Jesus actually by his spirit lives in you and you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He resides in you and he gives you gifts by his grace to deploy. Both superiority and inferiority have a negative effect on the health and effectiveness of the body of Christ. Let us be people at New Life that build and edify the body of Christ. May we not be a people that tears down the body of Christ. I want you to think of that person, perhaps, that if you're honest here today, yeah, you have a tough time loving. They push all the buttons of your life. And then I come over and I say, you know, I'm going to give you a picture of this person that uh, you sometimes struggle with. Nice, nice color photograph. And I put it on a wall and I say, now I'm going to give you some darts. (laughs) And I want you to think about all the stuff that bothers you about them. And maybe it's not just bother, you've been hurt by them. And so you take those darts and you go to town on that photo. And I mean, you are whipping those darts over and over and over again until that picture of that person is completely disfigured. You can't even make out who it is anymore. And then I walk over to that wall and I remove that image of that picture of that person. And if they are a brother and sister in the Lord what you'll find behind their photo is a picture of Christ. See, it was Jesus who said, whatever you do unto these, you do unto me. We are the body of Christ. And sometimes in our disappointments and in our unforgiveness, we forget and we utter slander and gossip and we tear people down in the body of Christ, but that's what you're doing. It's the body of Christ. And so, oh God, if we're going to see a resurgence of the Spirit, we're going to understand the the sanctity of the body of Christ, that there is a, a sacred part of this body of Christ, and so that when I interact with my brother or sister, even when we disappoint each other or hurt each other, somehow, God, give me the fortitude to love them, to strengthen them, to equip them, to embrace them, to protect them. Love covers. Love protects. Love doesn't expose. It protects. Love covers over a multitude of sins, doesn't it? Thanks be to God. When we see a resurgence of the Spirit, not only is there upward mobility in becoming more like Jesus, but we're also moved inward to build the church. Lastly, this morning, I believe when there is a resurgence of the Spirit, we will be moved outward to a lost world. There will be a compulsion in your life Kind of like Paul in Acts 20, 22 to 24. He says, I am compelled by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. The word compelled there means I'm literally in chains. I'm irresistibly aroused. I can't help myself but to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me there. But the only thing I know by the Spirit is that imprisonment and hardship await me. Oh, that's encouraging. And here's Paul, I'm in chains, I can't help myself, I gotta go to Jerusalem, I don't really know what awaits me there, the only thing I know is I'm gonna be thrown in prison. But I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I can complete the task of testifying of God's grace in my life. Did you get that? When the Holy Spirit is upon us, when a church, there is a resurgence of the Spirit, there is an understanding that this thing that we're doing is not about us, but it's about a world that is lost and going down a dead-end street, and it's our job to be light and hope in a dark world. Perhaps it's why after Pentecost, something happens People like Peter, who once denied knowing Jesus and was weak, 
got up after the day of Pentecost and the Spirit equipped him and he preached the first sermon and thousands of people get saved. There was a resurgence of the Spirit in and through this man's life. And then he walked a little more in Acts chapter 3 and he sees a lame man on the ground He says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. He was compelled outward to a lost world. How about Acts chapter 8? A man named Philip is called by the Spirit of God to come alongside a spiritual seeker, an Ethiopian eunuch. I love the story. Because the spirit of the Lord speaks to Philip with specific directions. He says to him, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Do you believe that God actually can speak to you directions? Philip, you need to go down that road. You need to go here. You need to go there because somebody needs you. And as he approaches this chariot and there's this Ethiopian eunuch, he actually is reading the prophets. That's called an open door, a divine appointment. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asks? How can I, unless someone explains it to me? So he invites Philip to come up to sit with him in the chariot. Are you getting this? When there is a resurgence of the spirit, when you're going to school, when you're going to university, when you're going to play softball, when you're, when, you're, when you're preparing finger foods, you're thinking of what neighbor needs to be part of this finger food event. <laughs> when you're thinking of playing baseball, you're thinking, what neighbor can I help invite to be part of us so that he gets to know us and be friends with us? There will be this, this compulsion to go and to share How about Acts chapter 9? Ananias, you see, behind a man named Saul who then became Paul, there was an Ananias. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to Ananias. Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. I love that. Go on Thompson Road. Go down Pringle Avenue. Go down Derry Road, turn right on Savaline, and go up that street. You'll pass the elementary school. Go left on Gooch Crescent. I just told you where I lived. (laughs) He's telling Ananias exactly where to go. Because there's a man there you need to talk to. Now, the problem for Ananias is the man he needed to talk to was Saul. He was a terrorist. It's like, can you not send me in some other house? Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. And placing his hands on Saul, he says to him, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on that road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could See again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Thank you, Lord, for Ananias, who dared to believe that the Holy Spirit could call him and direct him down Straight Street to encounter a man who would become one of the great leaders of the early church. You see, if we're going to talk about a resurgence, it's going to lead you down some dark roads. I believe there are dark places in our world because the light has never been willing to go there. God has called you to be the light of the world. I will clothe you with power, Acts 1.8 says, so that you can be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The point to the spirits and power is so that we can be witnesses for Christ. I conclude with this. It was a few years ago, I brought a team of young adults, maybe 50 of us, to China. 
And then we went to Hong Kong and we went to Macau and we did some ministry there. It was a long 30 day trip. And uh, that particular trip, I was speaking and preaching uh, a lot. And I had left one last day before we flew back to Canada for R&R, is what we called it, rest and relaxation. And it was going to be in this great city of Hong Kong. And so there I was, woke up, and I was exhausted. In 30 days, I believe I had preached 60 times. And so I'm there at the waterfront in, at the, waterfront in the great city of Hong Kong, and I'm enjoying it, I'm resting, and then all of a sudden, I sense the Holy Spirit speak to me. And I got to be honest, my first response was, no, 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 no. Please, I just want one day. One day of peace, one day of just relaxation. And I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, you see that young man sitting on the steps about 50 yards from you? You need to go talk to him. And I got to tell you, I wrestled with the Lord and I thought, no, Lord. You know, and I, you come up with all of these excuses. He probably doesn't speak English and he would probably be like, who are you? You're a Yahoo. Like, get out of here. Like, I don't want to talk to you. And you think of all the negative and all the bad things that could possibly happen. And I've wrestled with this and I wrestled with this. And finally I caved in and I began to walk towards this young man. And then when I was about three steps behind him, I chickened out and sat down. And I'm sitting there again, and I'm still wrestling. And the Holy Spirit is like, you need to talk to this young man. And I'm thinking, what, how, what am I going to say? How what do I start this conversation? And across the waterfront, he shows me a cross. The Lord does. And he says, start asking him about that. So I get up and I sit beside him. The moment I sit beside him, I didn't realize it, but he was reading something and he closed it really quick and he put it in his pocket. And I thought that was kind of strange. And I started a conversation. He spoke great English, by the way. And I said, what, what, what's, what's that across the water there? And he says, he looked at me kind of, it's a cross. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, okay. I said, uh, what is the building? And he says, oh, that's an historical church. And, you know, people go there. And I said, do you go to church? He says, well, are you kidding me? He says, I'm an atheist. I don't even believe there's a God. I'm like, great God. I told you this was going to be a waste of time. <laughs> He's like, what are you doing here? And I told him, you know, we brought a team and we've been doing some work in high schools and colleges and in the community, some humanitarian aid and all this kind of stuff. And he, said, and he was intrigued. Then I began to share my story and I began to share the gospel with him. And there was a part in the conversation where Alex began to weep. And you need to understand that culturally that was not something that normally would happen in a young man who's talking to a stranger. But he's weeping. And I said, Alex, are you okay? He's like, you don't understand what just happened. And I said, please tell me. And he goes back into his pocket. And he opens up this brochure. And he said, a friend of mine from university gave me this the other day. And she said I needed to read it. And he's, he shows it to me and it's, it's a gospel track. He says, I was reading this whole message of Jesus, what Jesus did on the cross. And I remember thinking to myself, God, I don't believe this is true. You're going to have to reveal yourself to me to prove that this is actually real. And then you showed up. <laughs> you know, I led Alex to Christ that day on the steps of the Hong Kong waterfront. Phoned the youth pastor right away. I said, bro, you got to get down here. You got to meet this guy. I, I was not a very good, I was a reluctant, 
you know, kind of weak and trembling and all the excuses. I wasn't very good. But boy, the Holy Spirit pursues people because he loves them like crazy. When there is a resurgence of the Spirit of God, you can't help yourself but to be moved outward to a lost world. Your neighbors, your co-workers, your classmates. To the young people in this room, you're not too young to be an incredible ambassador for Christ. I, I, I wasn't planning on sharing this, but I, I got to share it. My son is my middle son. He goes to Schulich Business School at York University. It's a very dark place, like most of our universities in our nation. But here's this kid. The other day, I, 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 I noticed he put his Bible in his backpack, and off he, he went. He takes the GO train, the GO bus, TTC. It takes him two hours to get to school from Milton. And he puts his Bible in his backpack, and off he goes. Now, in that moment, I was like, I, I wanted to get involved. What are you doing? Why are you... But I just like, Dad, just stay out of it. And I watched him do this for several days. So the other day I said, hey, Luke, I noticed you're bringing your Bible to school. And he's like, yeah, you know, after one of the lectures, it's, I, I kind of go in the back of the lecture hall and, and I, I do my devotions. And I thought, yeah. As a dad, I mean, that's, that, you live for that moment, right? You live for that moment. And then he's kind of like, you know, I, I was thinking to myself, were you ever going to tell me this? Like, this is great. Like, this is a great encouragement to me. He's like, oh, and he just keeps talking kind of casually. He's like, yeah, and it's kind of weird. Like, recently I've had some classmates come around me asking me what I'm reading. And I said, yeah. And he says, I'm reading my Bible. And they're like, really? Could you read that out loud for us? And I'm like, so Luke, what did you do? I says, I write out loud. And he says, I've been doing this for a few weeks, and now I've got 10 of my classmates who are coming around me after the lecture in York University in the back, and there's Lucas with his Bible, and they all have the Bible app on their phones. They're, 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 they're Buddhists, they're Muslim, they're Hindu, they're, they're atheists, and they're all there listening to little Lucas reading the Bible. And they're asking questions. And he says, the last class, they all looked at me and says, Lucas, you better not forget your Bible next week. A resurgence of the Holy Spirit. Oh, yes, universities can be locked down and liberal, and profs can tear it all apart, and they can limit the church getting on this campus, but there's little Lucas there. And you're there for a reason. And with the Spirit's power, God's going to bring you down straight street, <laughs> and he's going to put you down on Savaline, and he's going to say, go here and open that Bible because it's living and it's active, and there's a famine in the land. That famine is not of water and food, but it's of the word of God, and it will transform people's lives. We're not just fig trees with leaves. We're fig, we're, we're fig trees that actually are bearing fruit. Come on, could you stand with me? Oh, Lord Jesus, worship team, I just want you to lead. Can you open up your hearts and your hands up to the Lord? Come on, let this be a place. This is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're not just doing religion in the house of God today. This is a house of prayer where things happen, lives are transformed. And if you've come into this place and you're struggling with stuff, maybe it's with sin, maybe you need a touch in your body, I know this, my God is supreme. My God is great. And he can intersect your path today and he could do what no one else can do. And so as we worship, I want you to begin to open your mouth all over this place and I begin to just ask the Lord, God, come into me.
Holy Spirit, fill me. Holy Spirit, empower me. Holy Spirit, change me. And if you need to kneel down where you are, kneel down. I'm not going to manufacture anything. If you need to come to an altar, you come to an altar. If you need to bring your spouse, if you need to bring your family, if a hey, young adults come together, whatever you need to do, find the spot and meet with God. He's in the house today. Let's worship the Lord as you respond accordingly. Jesus, Jesus, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come in this place. Mighty God. today. our prayer, God. Find a spot in the front. Prayer team, if you can come. We've got some anointing oil there if you need to be anointed today. I know it's a little later, but you know what? God is up to something in the house today. You come. You come to be prayed for. Welcome. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Here we are, Lord. Right now, Lord. Yes, Lord. 
Those that are in the aisles, you can make your way right to the front. Right to the front. Prayer team, if you can be deployed, just right in the front here, brothers and sisters. Yes, Lord, we're here. Yes, Lord. Jesus. Jesus, right now. Minister to every person. Use me how you want to go. Yes, Lord. Have you thrown within my heart? Lord Jesus.
already greater Great are you, Lord, let's sing that again Great are you, Lord Oh I want to see you, I want to see you, I want to see you, and open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, cause I want to see you, cause I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up Oh, shining in the light of your glory For all your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy And open the eyes of our hearts Lord, open the eyes of our hearts, because oh, we want to see you. We want to see you. Open the eyes, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Won't you open the eyes of my heart? I want to see you I want to see you Oh, to see you I see you High and lifted up Oh, shining in the light of your glory For all your power and love As we sing Oh